put your hands together and welcome Francisco Gonzalez. Hello, hello, thank you. Thank you all, lovely to see you all. Welcome to my talk. This is That Does Work, designing player-friendly adventure games. Before I start, I want to give a special thanks to Tom Cole, Amy, and the other organizers and volunteers of AdventureX. So this talk is basically going to be about modifying your design and making choices to minimize negative feedback in your adventure games. But first, who am I? Well, my name is Francisco Gonzalez, or Francisco Gonzalez para mis compadres eh, hispanohablantes. Uh, I'm known as Grunislav Games. I am a solo indie developer from Miami, Florida, currently living in Brooklyn, New York. I, uh, why doesn't that pop up? Uh, there we go. I began making games using Adventure Game Studio in 2001. And I went full-time indie in 2013. I released my first commercial game in 2014. You might know some of my work, the Ben Jordan Paranormal Investigator series, The Golden Wake, Shardlight, Lamplight City and currently working on Rosewater. Um, I've been making point and click adventures for a long time. I'll be pulling most of my examples from my own work. Also, when I wrote this talk back in the summer, I fully expected Rosewater to be out by now. Ha 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 ha. What an idiot. But uh, I have some examples from Rosewater, but don't worry if you're concerned about spoilers, I'm keeping them to a minimum, so there's that. All right, so before I start, a couple of disclaimers. I want to clarify a couple of things. I'm not here to tell you what you absolutely should and shouldn't do. This is uh, just a talk focused on things that I've observed and learned and changed in my own design, so your mileage may vary. Uh, feel free to disagree with anything I have to say, but please, everyone's been very well behaved about this, but you know what they say about you have to put it up because it's happened. Please save all your comments and questions for the end of the talk because I get distracted if I'm interrupted. So. Uh, what I'm going to be talking about, based on just a brief overview of the talk, I'm going to start off by uh, defining what I define as negative feedback. Uh, then I'm going to talk a little bit about modifying your user interface. Then I'm going to talk a little about modifying puzzle design. And then if there's time at the end, we'll have some Q&A. So let's dive right into it. What is negative feedback? Negative feedback for purposes of this talk is not the narrator or the player character directly insulting the player character, as we can see here in uh, Space Quest. Thank you, by the way, Trolls, for providing me this screenshot. Um, I, for the purposes of this talk, am defining it as I or you, depending on the person the game is written in, uh, don't want to or can't do that with no further elaboration. The most infamous example of this being that right there. How many of you, show of hands, can hear this image? That's what I thought. So let's have a, a purifying, cleansing, let's get the negativity out of the room on three. I want everybody to say what's said, said up there. One, two, three. That doesn't work. All right, but it is going to work. So I want to illustrate this point in this short video clip. Uh, Sally Beaumont, who couldn't be here, but if you're watching, hi, Sally, uh, talks about this in this clip from uh, how to be a video game voice actor during the Adventure X Game Jam in 2021. Oh, it didn't play. Why didn't it play? Uh, oops. <laughs> oh, nope, hang on. Uh, how do you get videos to play? Uh, oh, dear. Uh, that doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> well, all right, so anyway. I've watched this enough. So Sally basically says in this video that as a voice actor, it helps to know adventure games because you have to know why you're recording several different variations of that doesn't work or I can't use these things together. And she points out that this is a, the bread and butter stuff of adventure games. But I'm here to tell you, it doesn't have to be. Uh, let's go over some of the, excuse me, some of the fundamentals of adventure game design. So. Adventure Game Design 101, you have your player character or your narrator who serves as the proxy for the player exploring the game world. Usually they provide uh, room and object descriptions, they give hints and clues. And one of the unique aspects of adventure game design, the thing that we as designers all strive for, uh, some have called it the holy grail of adventure games, is the aha moment when a puzzle solution is uh, revealed. It's the reward of, that the player feels solving a puzzle.
lazy response, really. The second one, you can't do that, at least not now, is pretty infamous because, you know, it's giving you a false hope, essentially. Uh, in the early days, these kinds of generic responses were basically a cover for the text parser not understanding your command. But the second one especially is misleading because, as I said, it sets this false hope that something might work later, but usually it never does. So here's my hot take. Adventure games should be fun, not frustrating. I don't want to spend my time playing a game that's telling me no 98% of the time. So we'll start by, we'll talk about modifying the user interfaces because uh, I feel like this is a major contributor to negative feedback and I'll go over some of the most common user interfaces in adventure games, starting with the verb interface, which was pioneered by Lucasfilm in Maniac Mansion, as you can see here. It started with 15 verbs. And of course, you had to construct sentences to interact with the world. And this was different from a text parser because it established what verbs the game actually understood. And the idea was that putting in a command would hopefully generate a response. And as they made more games, some of the verbs were removed. But oddly, there were two completely useless ones that remained for kind of a strangely long time. In the original version of The Secret of Monkey Island, turn on and turn off were still there despite the fact that there's nothing mechanical to turn on or turn off in the entire game. And of course, you know, I had to try that, and <laughs> that doesn't seem to work. But they always, you know, they always gave the same generic response, so why have them? Later versions, of course, replaced it with the standard nine verbs that we would later see in most LucasArts adventures. But the major problem with this interface still exists, which is that the majority of interactions are useless. And so as a result, you're most likely going to get a generic response. So in my game development career, I never used the verb interface precisely because of this reason. So moving on, we've got the icon bar, which is most familiar to fans of Sierra Adventure games. Of course, this, u this user interface has icons which can be selected to interact with the world. You've got the standard eye for look, hand for interact, uh, speech bubble for talk. And later games expanded on this to varying degrees. You had uh, Space Quest IV, which added the smell and taste icon that gave you funny interactions. You had the Leisure Suit Larry games, which added the zipper, of course. And then you had Gabriel Knight, which went completely overboard with uh, <laughs> splitting up the talk icon into two separate icons for talk and interrogate. Uh, it expanded the standard hand interact cursor to open, move, pick up, and operate. And so, yeah, a lot of choices. Uh, I used that, uh, the icon bar in the Ben Jordan series, but when I started ga uh, developing games commercially, I realized that less is more, so I switched over to the two-click interface. If you use Adventure Game Studio, you might know this as the Beneath a Steel Sky template. Uh, this, of course, is, uh, features one standard cursor, which never changes. The left click interacts with things. The right click examines things. Um, later, uh, Revolution Software, uh, expanded on this with Broken Sword, where they had a context-sensitive uh, set of icons. Right-clicking was still used to look at things, but when the mouse cursor went over a hotspot that had another specific interaction, the icon would change. So you had, you know, magnifying glass to examine, uh, gears to operate, pick up, etc. Um, I used the Beneath a Steel Sky style uh, two-click interface in my first two commercial games of Golden Wake and Shardlight, and I learned a very important lesson, and that is nobody right-clicks. Seriously, the majority of players forget <laughs> that you can right-click to look at stuff. And as a result, they usually always get the interact text. And usually, the interact text is, as I found when I was writing Shardlight, the player or the narrator telling you why they can't or they don't want to interact with something. And I'm really sad this is not going to play because I got permission to pick on this game. This is a video from the <laughs> opening of uh, the excavation of Hobbs Barrow. And uh, we'll have to imagine the scene here. Uh, oh, wait. Oh, 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 it might actually play. Nope. <laughs> nope. Anyway, the scene is Thomasina Bateman is on this nice rainy platform in Bewley. Uh, it's raining. There's great atmosphere. The most prominent thing in the scene is the sign that says Bewley, and you click on it, and you think that you, she might offer some insight onto her arrival in town or comment on her journey, but instead she says, if I took the sign, how would the trains know where to stop? 
Now, to Cloak and Dagger's credit, it is a unique response, and it's pretty funny. I imagine she just yoinks the sign at the train, just go, you know, and she's like, oh, I took the sign. But it shows, it shows the issue, an issue that I had in Shardlight. Um, in the first room, you can see there's this small sign on the wall, and this is the right-click text to look at it. Now, now to, uh, notice how it gives you important information. It establishes that there's a fan. It's probably important, and it is. It's used in a couple of puzzles, and it also hints that you should look around for the controls. And this is the left-click to interact text. So if a player forgets to right-click, they're denied all that information, and they're left stumbling around trying to figure out what to do. So when I was writing Shardlight, I found myself at the mercy of this two-click interface. On one hand, I really enjoyed writing the look descriptions for every item because it gave me the chance to build the world and offer insight into main character Amy's life and personality. But on the other hand, I felt really frustrated because I had to come up with responses for interact because usually it was always something negative. With the exception, some exceptions, like here where clicking on a wanted poster let me uh, take a dig at the Assassin's Creed series. Uh, sorry, Giles, uh, yeah, by association. Uh, but the truth is, I got really tired of having to come up with reasons why Amy couldn't interact with things. In fact, I got so tired of it that I committed a huge sin. I wrote, I got so bored of writing negative interaction lines that I created a special unhandled event function that would cycle through four random messages whenever you decided to, whenever you clicked on something that uh, didn't have a custom interact message. Now imagine playing this game as somebody who doesn't right click. The entire thing would just be Amy telling you why she can't do things. That's not fun. So, what's the solution? Well, spoilers, there is no one right solution. But, here are some suggestions. First, and most obvious, write more unique responses. And obviously this can be a monumental task, especially if you're gonna have voice acting because it will balloon your line count. But the more unique responses, the better. When writing your feedback, Get out of the default I can't mindset. Describe how an object feels or make a joke or an amusing observation like in Hobbs Barrow. If it's a sign on a wall, have the look and interact messages be the same. But then you might be asking if the messages are the same, why bother having the two-click interface at all? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. I've been pushing a secret agenda this whole time. Consider the single-click interface. Now, I once was told this by, uh, at, at AdventureX by, um, oh gosh, the, for, by Sky Goblin. And uh, I was like, well, that's ridiculous. No, when I think of the single-click interface, and when you probably think of the single-click interface, you probably think of King's Quest VII or The Dig, and you probably worry that it dumbs down the gameplay or limits your interactivity. That's what I used to think. But actually what it does is it guarantees a unique response for every interaction. You as the designer have the ultimate control over what interactions you offer the player. So that means that they'll trust that all interactions must be worthwhile simply by virtue of being available. Also keep in mind that it's extra cruel to give your player the on only one thing to do and then tell them that it was dumb or wrong. <laughs> so I used the single click interface in Lamplight City, but I made it somewhat context sensitive, a la Broken Sword. So as you can see here, the cursor changes based on the type of interaction. So we had a magnifying glass for look, a hand for interact, and a mouth for talking to characters. But there were also hotspots whose interactions could change based on the game state. So for instance, in this screen, um, these hanging plants, they initially start off as look, but as you investigate and you learn that you need a tool to pick a lock in a win uh, for a window upstairs, the icon then changes to interact for the same hotspot because you can pick up one of the hooks to use as the tool that you need. So doing this eliminated having to worry about lines like, oh, I don't want to take the hook right now. But at the same time, it also presented the problem of not being able to look at the plants anymore once the cursor changed. And if you hadn't looked at them yet, then you didn't really know what they were necessarily. So I decided to modify the UI more in Rosewater. It's still a context-sensitive uh, context single-click interface. The things that have only one interaction have a dedicated icon, as you can see here, with look and speak. But then clicking on things that have multiple interactions brings up a menu with available actions. And every verb provides a unique response. 
So, as a side note, let's talk about inventory. Nobody wants players to resort to using everything on everything because it usually results in, I can't use those things together. And that happened to me in Shardlight. Of course, Lamplight City had famously or infamously had no inventory. So when I brought it back for Rosewater, I thought about how to avoid those generic messages. And so I did something similar to what was done in The Longest Journey. Now in The Longest Journey, inventory, when you selected it, it would only flash or highlight over a hotspot or a character where they could be used. And if it wasn't highlighted and you clicked, you wouldn't get a response. The more recently, Return to Monkey Island did the same thing. However, in both of these games, it's limited to the correct inventory item only highlighting over the correct hotspot where it can be used. In Rosewater, I have hotspots that can be, that, or that have, or hotspots where inventory items can be used, and that's, that causes the inventory items to highlight over them, but any inventory item will highlight over it, uh, not just the correct one. So you can see here with the hotspot indicator, all of the hotspots on the screen, but the selected inventory item only highlights over the locks in the center there. Uh, this prevents the ability to click the item on every hotspot and eliminates the generic, I can't use that, their responses. But you might be asking, what happens if you use the wrong inventory item on something? So here I tried shifting to a more positive response by giving a clue or nudging the player in the right direction. So if you use any item that's not a, uh, these lock picks on the padlock, this isn't going to get the padlock open or break it. So this isn't a generic response, it's specific. It gives the player an, an idea of why you would need to use an inventory item on this hotspot in the first place. Same here. You'll definitely notice if I swap this for the bag, so you think, I need to swap something for this bag. So moving on to modifying puzzle design, this could be another talk in and of itself, but I want to focus on one specific example to point you in the right direction. Uh, there's one situation in puzzle design that leads to a lot of road blocking and negative feedback, and that is sequence breaking. And sequence breaking is something that I experienced both in Shardlight and Lamplight City, and this refers to the player do doing something out of the designer's established order. It can be finding a puzzle too early, or if it's a code puzzle and the code doesn't change, you know it from a previous playthrough, you just put it in and skip it. And generally this disrupts or skips over an important part of the game. So uh, if you played Shardlight, you might remember this puzzle, uh, where you had to draw a symbol on a chalkboard using the book on the left as your guide. And this revealed a sequence of letters on the board there of an action you needed to perform to get into a secret area. Um, and of course, you needed to pick up a piece of chalk to be able to draw this symbol. But most people found this puzzle before they even knew that the chalk existed. So the game would exit the close-up right away if you didn't have the chalk. But this led to players getting frustrated because they were focused on the puzzle. And the clue that you needed to get a piece of chalk was, guess where it was? The right-click message. So nobody found it. So some, some people went as far as taking a screenshot of the close-up in the split second that it appeared and blocking out the squares in Photoshop or Paint or whatever and getting the answer. And then when you tried doing the thing, it wouldn't work because the game didn't acknowledge that you had drawn the sign. So basically the puzzle was unsolvable unless you drew the symbol. And if you didn't, it wouldn't work. So in Lamplight City, I also had a puzzle where you had to input a sequence of uh, notes on this uh, harpsichord to, uh, to reveal a secret compartment in the wall. Spoilers if you haven't played Lamplight City. Uh, by the way, it's on sale right now. Uh, <laughs> uh, so the reveal of this happening is pretty major. It's a pretty major plot point. And since the code never changes between uh, games, if you know the, the code and the player starts again and enters it right away, on a second playthrough, if that happened and you open the compartment, it would pretty much go over the entire, like it would, it would render the entire case pointless, really. Uh, so my solution was, if you enter it too early, you get called a cheater. And guess what? People don't like that. <laughs> so some solutions for how to uh, avoid sequence breaking. If you have a code, and you can, I would suggest randomizing it so that it's different every playthrough. Um, if the player finds the puzzle first, make it clear if there are more steps required to solve it. 
uh, because a player will focus on a puzzle once they've found it. So you should try and signpost that it can't be solved without a tool, if you need a tool, for example. So with shard light, should have just let the door open. If you, did, if you went through the trouble of solving the puzzle yourself outside the game, you, could have you should have just been able to get in. <laughs> Um, also, the, the puzzle itself was poorly thought out because I didn't anticipate that, posi that possibility of, of uh, people taking screenshots, which leads to the next point. Swallow your pride, because as a designer, and I'm very guilty of this, you want people to play your game, and you want them to solve these amazing puzzles that you've made for them, but not everybody is going to love your puzzles as much as you do. So in Rosewater, there's this sequence late in the game where you find this long hallway, it's got a bunch of identical doors, and the point is you need to deduce which of the rooms you need to break into. And so there's all these clues in the, in the area that you have to look at, and there's this great deduction puzzle that I came up with that I was really proud of. Um, and you know, that's how you, you figure out which, of the, which is the right room to break into. But I realized that it was entirely possible to just use your lock picks to just open every single door without even doing that, just brute forcing it, essentially. So I spent ages trying to figure out ways to prevent the player from doing that. Um, originally, if you tried to do this, uh, Harley, the main character, would just say that she didn't want to pick the lock until she was sure it was the right room. So you started off by being told no. So I couldn't think of any reasonable ways to stop players from, from brute forcing it. The best I came up with was requiring the player to click on things to look at them. So like, you know, hotspots in this picture, looking at all the clues. But if you did that, the game would, you know, set a flag to say, okay, player looked at this item, so obviously they have this information. But the things are in plain sight. You don't have to click on them. If, if you look at them, you say, okay, I see this guy has this thing, that must mean the clue you would have to manually click for the game to acknowledge that you did that. So there's that disconnect there. And I was really frustrated because I was proud of this puzzle. So in the end, I just swallowed my pride. I threw out all the roadblocks and I said, you know what, play your way. If you want to brute force it, you can brute force it. That's totally fine. Or you can, you can do the deduction thing and feel smart about it. That's totally fine too. But the important thing is that the game is letting you play your own way. So for this puzzle, this is a classic example of a door code puzzle, um, and it, it couldn't be changed because it ties into the narrative. Um, it's a date that ties into the narrative. So rather than calling the player a cheater if they try to input the code on a second playthrough, I just have your companion make a funny little remark about, oh, you guessed it, oh yeah, okay, sure. Um, and I was able to do this because the puzzle itself is designed in such a way that it doesn't skip over important plot moments if you don't gather the clues that you need to solve it first. So, some final thoughts. Get out of the negative mindset. Watch out for I can't, I don't want to, I don't feel like, and think of more positive ways to communicate your feedback. Every interaction is an opportunity for a clue. Remember that you have the power to guide the player, and you should use it to help them rather than hinder them. Find ways to make your puzzle design less brittle so you don't have to say no so often. Look for ways to mitigate sequence breaking so you don't force players on the one true path that you've designed. If they break the rules, acknowledge it playfully instead of just wrapping them on the knuckles. And finally, focus on fun. Adventure games are about exploration and interaction. The more bespoke responses you have, the more interactive it feels. And the more interactive it feels, the more the player will have fun. So that's my talk. Thank you. And we have five minutes. If there are any questions, please show me your hands. Perfect. Very near. Hi. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, you mentioned having the character give you a hint as to, you know, this bag needs to be swapped or whatever, something like that. How do you avoid making the player feel like they're more stupid than the character they're playing? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I mean, ideally, yeah, you want the player and the player character to be on the same page. Um, but if the player is... Ideally, if the player in that situation, if they've clicked an item on the bag, it's because they generally have an idea that, that clicking an item on the bag 
will do something. Maybe they may not think specifically, oh, I need to swap it for something, but they think, oh, you know, I, I should use an inventory item here. And then if the player, if they're right, then they feel great because they got it. And if they're not, then, you know, they get that nudge. So hopefully it doesn't make them feel stupid because they've, they've, they've sort of gotten half the idea there. Do we have uh, maybe one more question? I'm back here now, so I'm in the corner. Is there a hand I can't see? I think we've covered every single issue. <laughs> you've, you've solved it. A round of applause. Hooray, thank you.